Hello everyone and welcome to History Lessons for Role Players. Uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about Greek science and magic. Now many uh, people who play roleplay games, they're familiar with all of the elemental aspects of magic. Uh, the building of walls, the throwing of fireballs. But what they're probably not aware of is the fact that a lot of this idea of the four natural elements, it all began with the Greeks. Now, science itself could be argued to have begun with the Greek philosophers, but theirs was a very rudimentary uh, science. It certainly wasn't the scientific method. Uh, results were not necessarily proven and reproven as they were uh, during the scientific age uh, after the Renaissance. But where the Greek scientists started to deviate in a very important function was that they stopped uh, attributing everything to the gods. Now they might have had a spiritual and supernatural aspect as, as explanation to fill the why and the how on things they didn't understand, but they also started to just look at the world. And from those uh, uh, causal relationships, they were developing a scientific method of sorts. They were using a best guess approach, uh, and also they practiced soothsaying. They wanted to make sure that what they were predicting could possibly also benefit them in the future by having uh, a knowledge of the future. They saw nature as a set of opposing forces, always in opposites and always in balance. The uh, Greeks also conceived of an atom, and uh, they were the first to start talking about a void, the absence of matter. They categorized animals into types. It was a precursor of zoology. These were all fundamental things that were not done before. Uh, people, and especially religions of the day, would accept creatures as just as um, separate, but as distinctly uh, different, where the Greeks were starting to look at them saying that, well, you know, a camel and a horse, they're very close to one another. The Greeks uh, did a lot of study of botany. Uh, they looked at uh, different uh, plants and they started to classify plants. They also practiced uh, an early version of canning and they also used refrigeration by uh, using snowfall from the mountain peaks and also by digging down into uh, root cellar type of functions. Theirs was a farming culture like most ancient cultures but also it had a large maritime force. Not only was the fishing important but the trade there, uh, biremes, triremes, galleys, uh, were all over the Mediterranean exchanging ideas and exchanging uh, goods and services with uh, other peoples of the eras. Their observations were honest. In some cases they were erroneous, but they definitely were uh, attempting their explanation. For instance, the eye itself was thought to cast out a beam to espy or a pile of rags left uh, to its own devices would turn into a pile of mice. Uh, they did not see the blanket keeping in a person's warmth, they saw the blanket itself as being able to create warmth. Now Plato was one of the first uh, uh, people who, who started to reject um, he wasn't totally able to reject the supernatural but he felt that uh, um, it, it, it was more manipulated by men than divinity uh, of the deities. He saw reality as a copy of a more pristine realm. He didn't know if the gods themselves were housed in this reality or they too were shut out from it. But he wasn't also ready to say that a man was ready to exist in this perfect pristine realm. But a lot of his uh, uh, philosophical views were also uh, inspired skeptics to start to question the ideas of the time and start to wonder if something lacks proof or especially something doesn't have a practical cause, then why is it practiced in general? The wise were starting to be seen as opportunistic, where the young were rejecting the face of a previous generation. It's, it sounds true for many an age. The fact that they were, um, the Greeks were a democracy, uh, it, arguably it was a democracy of a certain landed gentleman, but it was uh, sort of like ours when we first started. They did not have uh, rights of, of voting for the, by slaves or by women, but it certainly did uh, have uh, uh, voting as a practiced way of appointing their, their uh, next dictator in line. But I don't want to go into the politics of the Greeks. I want to get back to the, actually the science. The Greeks were one of the first to start talking about the four elements. They looked at air, water, earth, and fire as, uh, as natural things but also as things that could possibly be controlled through magic. 
Now, air especially, it was, it was puzzling to them because it, it seemed to be condensed and it could be uh, uh, transform water into a steam. So they didn't quite understand the states of matter that they could be solid, a liquid gas, but they did understand that perhaps something like water was a combination of both air and the natural element of water. Now water itself was seen as a blessing. It was both the birth of the man and the birth of the, of the world. The world uh, arose out of the water. Uh, there was also the, uh, the erosion caused by water could be seen as a dominant feature and uh, rivers would carve a course. And uh, as uh, maritime uh, people, they would have their boats on the water and it wasn't so much a question of why a boat would float. It certainly obviously had more of the element air than water in it or air than earth in it but they also looked at um, uh, childbirth as the flush of the womb as being born inside of water a lot of the uh, uh, scientists of the Greek era were uh, physicians they were healers and they were trying to look for practical solutions of, of why disease was striking or why hunger was uh, the cause of illness and uh, these as well, uh, they would try to apply back to the four elements. Uh, earth was seen as uh, the earth itself. But it also they theorized that uh, because they could look at the sediment in, on the sides of mountains and the strips of sediment in the rock uh, as something that was formed under pressure, they could actually see that uh, uh, to a limited extent that if you put a weight on something, it would flatten. In the whole idea of Earth having a gravity, having a uh, a sense of uh, of impetus, was uh, uh, important to them. And finally, the fourth one, fire. Now, fire was a source of warmth and comfort. It was lighting. Uh, sometimes fire uh, was seen as a as a in a liquid form. The fact it could move. Uh, lightning, of course, was seen as fire coming from the sky. But the observations that they were making, they tried to distill all of the natural phenomena of the world uh, into the interactions of these four elements. Now, they also observed magnetism, but they had no idea how to explain it. Gravity was a lot easier to explain. You would pick up a stone and you would let it go. It would fall to the earth. It was seen as all the elements seemed to want to attract to one another. The air wanted to be in the air. Water wanted to be in basins. You could see if you poured water, it would flow back to other sources of water. The fire itself would consume itself and transform from the tree of the fireplace into uh, the light and the brilliance of fire. Fire was seen as always fleeting. But yes, they observed a magnetism of uh, the lodestone. Uh, they never did uh, create a, a, a compass for navigation from it, although there, there might have been a few uh, very clever people who kept it as a secret. Let's go back into a little bit more of the magical properties that they were exhibiting. Now, if you're actually in a game mechanic and you look at those four elements, if everything in the universe was created with these four elements, you can eliminate the science uh, that sometimes uh, gets added into fantasy games. You don't really want a practical science to inhabit your fantasy game. You'll get your players trying to make nuclear reactors or, or uh, distilling metal that they shouldn't be able to under the uh, technology of the time. But the four natural elements, air, water, earth, and fire, those, uh, those are a lot more of the gist of gaming, especially when it comes to magic. Now magic uh, it, it can be seen as an elemental balance or disruption between those, uh, those four elements. Uh, the alchemists of the, of, for thousands of years thought, uh, sought to create purity. They saw gold as not necessarily a pure element. Later on they would see it as a pure element. But the Greeks didn't see gold as a pure element. They saw it as a pure mixture of an equal part of fire, earth, air, and water. It, it was a perfect balance, this gold. And mostly it was because gr er, uh, gold, you can beat on it, you can pour it on it, uh, pour acid on it, you can do a lot of things to gold and it would still remain gold. And that's not the truth for anything else. Um, they were dividing the elements uh, from the whole and they studied them individually. For instance, they could, uh, they could remove the earth, they thought, from a mace, and uh, a mace head, and uh, make the metal lighter. And it, they actually could. You could, uh, you could make the metal from a stronger uh, iron rather than from a bronze, which uh, would dominate in an earlier era. They were removing the water from firewood uh, to make a charcoal. And charcoal burns a lot hotter because it doesn't have to uh, boil that water, that sap, off. 
Uh, they were moving, uh, they, they viewed the air uh, as being uh, uh, foul in somebody who was choking. They were gasping for air or suffocated by smoke. And uh, you could remove uh, the fire from a plant uh, to make it more edible and more tastier. Uh, when something was uh, off-putting to uh, the taste bud, it was usually seen as that there was a fire element to it that needed to be purged. It's actually a little bit opposite to what uh, we would see today as I uh, put that chili in there and make it hotter for me. Now role play, you could also have people uh, increasing or decreasing elements in, in the environment uh, to do the same. For instance, what if uh, a magic user were to not just cast a, a spell out of a book, but instead remove the earth to lighten a blow uh, that somebody might be taking. Or they could um, strip the water out of a shield and uh, make it turn very brittle and inflexible so it doesn't work as well for the enemy. They could remove the air from an arrow so that it won't fly uh, straight, or remove fire from a blade so the edge instantly dulls. Now, at the same time that the uh, the Greek philosophers were studying the four elements of nature in their combinations. They were looking at everything as, as you know, how much air was in this object, how much fire was in an object. And even though fire would seem, uh, be seen as destructive, there was always a fire that was caged within the, both the uh, creatures and the structures. That when, you know, as long as that, that fire was contained within the log and not allowed to escape, it would be, uh, it would be in balance and it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't cause the, you know, the city or house to burn down. A uh, man Galen uh, is very important in Greek philosophy because uh, he was the first person to really study and um, quantify anatomy. Galen was studied for a long time. It was uh, Renaissance philosophers who discovered the texts of Galen that were translated into Arabic and, and later brought back into the Renaissance Italy that allowed them to start looking at the insides of people and uh, anatomy as a natural science and not just a version of prayers and mysticism. Galen practiced vivisection which meant he took live animals amputated and uh, dissected them while they were living because he wanted to see the heart beating and he was one of the first uh, people who uh, basically was uh, describing the heart as a major organ of the body now people you know especially soldiers would know hunters would know that if you stabbed a heart and caused it to stop beating a person would die the heart itself was also seen as the very soul of every creature you know when the heart was dead the creature was dead the mind itself was not seen as important. It uh, was mostly there to cool blood, according to the philosophers of the day. And, you know, similar to antlers. Antlers are another uh, way for an animal to, uh, to uh, uh, cool its blood. But at least uh, the, the mind um, during the Greek era was seen as a source of thought and not ignored entirely. Galen, with his vivisectionist, the way he performed it, he, uh, he would uh, amputate and restrain the animal by the neck. And a lot of times that, that slow uh, death by strangulation was uh, causing uh, hemorrhaging and causing uh, vascular damage that allowed him to reach some false conclusions. But for the most part, he was seeing that inside of the creature you would have blood and bile and phlegm and pus when it was actually infected. So he was making the general uh, conclusion that there was uh, four elements inside of the human body or inside of all creatures. He saw blood as the fire element. It had a very vivid color of course and then you could also see that people would be flushed when they were in ecstasy in, in the face or a lack of warmth in the extremity of the hands could be seen a paleness and uh, as if the blood, the, the fire was calmed in the person. Uh, bile, bile obviously is something that's excreted by the body, it's an earth, but the other aspect of it is that um, a kitchen fuel for the most part was not firewood. It takes a lot of effort to gather firewood as opposed to gathering cow dung. Now cow dung, if you mix it with a little bit of salt and desiccate it, it burns wonderfully and so a lot of the kitchen fuel was seen as cow dung and so it was again, bile was seen as a return to the earth with that salted cow dung that was popular as a kitchen fuel, especially in cities. You just could never bring in enough firewood to, uh, you'd take all forest of firewood to uh, to uh, supply the heat to a city uh, as big as Athens or uh, to a lesser extent uh, Corinth or, or uh, 
or Sparta. Uh, phlegm, the air, uh, coughing of course, when anyone was coughing in the expectorate, uh, sometimes it would be blood, but more often it would be just phlegm. And that phlegm was seen as, uh, the lungs itself were seen as a, 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 a mucus pile of phlegm that uh, as it was diseased, uh, tuberculosis of course was infecting the Egypt world. Phlegm, uh, the coughing uh, caused uh, by phlegm was seen as an, an imbalance of air in the body. The body was trying to get rid of this extra air, this extra phlegm. Finally, pus. Uh, you, you can imagine an ancient world of uh, farmers where everyone's, uh, you know, essentially using tools to, to hack into the ground and uh, knives to, to butcher. There'd be a lot of incidental cuts that wouldn't be treated. And the uh, Greeks uh, did not see uh, uh, bacteria. They theorized there might be something that was microscopic but they could not prove it. There was no way they could grind a glass into a lens uh, able uh, to observe any of this stuff. They did see pond water and pond scum as a form of uh, pus, a form of water, um, an imbalance. If there was too much of the water element within water, <laughs> of all things, you would have a mucus and a pus that would be created by it. You wanted your water uh, clear. You wanted it to have just the right amount of air and earth mixed into it. And of course, uh, carbonated water could be seen as uh, something that would be a little bit more pure and, and easy to drink. Or uh, fermented beverages were very popular in the ancient world and one of the major sources of clean water you would get from beer. And beer, of course, has a natural uh, air, carbon, uh, CO2 from the yeast and uh, the creation would be with uh, the added of sugars or hops so there would be an added earth element to it. Bones were seen as the more perfect uh, form, like gold, of a mix of fire, air, earth, and water. There was this balance of blood and bile and pus and phlegm that would congeal and make these wonderful things called bones that gave us all the structure in the body. And again, it was Galen who was slowly tracing the muscle movement. He could uh, uh, dissect animals as they were living and see how they reacted, how the muscles moved, how they jerked and reacted, how they were always constricting and pulling in pairs on the bones. The marvelous diagrams he created and these were studied for generation upon generation. Uh, Galen also influenced the study of uh, different uh, life. Uh, as they were dissecting um, uh, larger animals they could see the similarities between the horse and the goat and the sheep. They knew the horse was different from the elephant, but they also knew the two were similar, and the, the hippo, hippopotamus, the water horse, was seen as just another form of a, a little bit different from the horse. So this sort of categorization of, of wildlife and flora uh, led to them even a, a greater understanding. Now, uh, all of this would be uh, of little or no use if it was just academic, but many of the th uh, the things that Galen was discovering, you know, the excess of bile causing discomfort, an excess of phlegm signifying that the lungs were infected, uh, pus that needed to be excised from the body before it, it went gangrenous. Uh, even um, an abundance of blood was seen as a problem. A majority of humans will die by hypertension. You know, their blood pressure will, will just uh, wear out their heart. Uh, one of the uh, most primitive and effective cures for hypertension is actually bleeding. So if someone was seen as, uh, as being uh, overly uh, uh, angered or overly uh, aroused, the use of bleeding uh, as a practical element could uh, calm them down and uh, prolong their life. So it may be seen as an, an odd practice, but if it didn't work, they wouldn't have practiced it all through the Middle Ages and into the uh, Renaissance when eventually a, a drug and, uh, and chemical treatments were refined that could treat hypertension much better. Ancient Chinese had a fifth element, metal. They did not, uh, and this is uh, you know something I use in most of my roleplay games. I have five elements in my game related to magic, metal being uh, the, another one, metal uh, was seen as uh, binding spirits. Uh, the Chinese uh, were probably more on the road to our idea that elements of protons and electrons uh, were uniquely defined, but the Greeks would see metal as more of a, a purity of and a balance between the four other elements. So, what are we talking about here with the magic of life? Well. As I said, physicians could try to increase or decrease a patient's blood 
in order to uh, heal. They would see imbalances in the blood. Uh, and they wouldn't call it a blood poisoning, uh, blood infection, but they definitely would see uh, blood as the life uh, force within the body, moving the, the soul, the heart, uh, produced uh, uh, essence around through the flesh. And also blood would be seen as very important to the warriors. These were all warrior peoples. Uh, I think most of history, uh, the civilizations were were gauged by their warriors. The physicians of the day would try to uh, enrage the spirit and increase the blood of the warriors, and that was done through exercise. And part of the reason why the Olympics and the competitions were so important to the Greeks is they thought it was a way of building up blood within the body. There's probably some truth to that. I think the uh, amount of red blood cells and oxygenation in, in competitive athletes is certainly a lot more than I have in my sedentary scholarly gaming life. Uh, pus, of course, was excised, and they knew that it could fester and poison. And uh, bile was purged with uh, laxatives, uh, natural laxatives. These were found by study. When you were starting to categorize plants, you could start to see cause and effect. Here, eat this. How does it feel? How does it make you change? They were experimenting both as uh, scholars on themselves for these potions, but also uh, they were adopting more of the common sense uh, that was uh, collectively being created of the day. Uh, there was a lot of wisdom that was being collected on the local level, especially among the peasantry. You know, if this injury occurred, well, we would you know chew up this type of leaf and put it on. Who knows where the origin of that was? Again, if it worked, it would continue to do it. What the uh, philosophers of the Greek era were starting to do is they starting to take that collective wisdom and not dismiss it and say that, oh, it was just the gods who really healed the man. They were trying to figure out what would do it, and so they discovered more of um, the laxatives, and uh, they knew that uh, when people were constipated or people had diarrhea, they would need to um, uh, treat that. And uh, the bile itself, they, they knew that the smell of it, that the, the decay of it, um, could also induce a fear and a nausea. And so there was an element of trying to eliminate that fear and nausea from person to put their uh, four uh, natural humors, is what they called it. They, uh, the four elements, uh, fire, earth, air, and water, inside of uh, creatures, inside of human flesh, were called four humors, uh, usually spelled with a, uh, a U, so that it's uh, different from the humors of a, a humorous uh, Aristophanes play. And again, going back to the role play aspect, the, uh, the, if in, in your gaming, uh, perhaps somebody could restore blood to heal or capture a monster's blood to create some sort of potion of restoration. Uh, you could coat your arms and weapons with poison uh, from the pus of a dead creature, arachnids. Uh, there are a lot of times people are, would, would say in uh, fantasy games that if you could collect the, the dragon's teeth, you can use them for some sort of enchanted army, or you can... Uh, uh, use the blood of the dragon and coat your weapon to kill another more powerful creature like a demon or dispel uh, the dragon's kin. You could also scare away uh, uh, simple-minded folks in your role-play games with smells. You used to hurl pots of bile, you know, it could be so distasteful that, uh, that animals could be turned in fear from a more primitive intelligence which naturally shun the dead. Most creatures don't hang around dead corpses out of instinct. Uh, those that were more attracted to dead corpses ended up dead themselves from the diseases that would be transmitted. And then finally the curse of, you could curse an enemy by increasing the phlegm in their lungs, it would slow their actions, it would distract them, and uh, the very air itself could be congealed into a phlegm green pudding or the, the gelatin cubes. The Greeks were studying the cosmos. Uh, they had mapped the stars in very precise details. It started as the uh, constellations just being uh, a more of a, a, a pattern for their heroes, a, a place to tell stories and point to the heavens like a storybook page. But they also were observ observing comets and, and they saw these uh, sort of new stars and wanderers. They could observe that the planets themselves didn't follow the same patterns, uh, endless patterns that you would see in the celestial motion. As the um, Earth moves around the Sun, relatively speaking, uh, it, certain constellations appear at certain times of the year more frequently and uh, or more perceptively, and 
this was all known, but then there were these wandering planets, and they didn't understand them as planets, they just called them wanderers, would appear in different constellations and move around almost at random. But it was Ptolemy who started to study them and uh, apply mathematics to them and realized that, well, they actually move in their own sort of patterns. Now there was this idea of retrograde motion where a star would move a fixed distance each day toward the horizon to where when it's out of season it wouldn't be seen. But the planets wouldn't do that. They would seem to move but then decide to turn direction and go the other way. Ptolemy pictured wheels upon wheels where if you picture a, a large um, wheel circling the heavens around us and then these smaller wheels within the wheel would be moving uh, the planets in a circle within a circle. And there were models that were actually created of the Ptolemaic heavenly celestial movement and they would function. It was incredibly complex to try to describe everything in terms of circles within circles. Mathematically it can be done, it's just a lot more simpler when you put the sun at one place of the ellipses and everything moving an elliptical pattern around it. That actually was uh, theorized uh, by uh, one of the Greeks where they thought that it would make a lot more sense if we move about the sun or if the world itself were to be a globe and was spinning it would make more sense. And these were not necessarily accepted as the common thoughts of the day. It just seemed too heretical. When you stand, even today we get flat earthers, when you stand on the, on the world, it just doesn't seem to be anything but flat. It's only maritime people that can see, especially around the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, they can watch the ships trying to move out into the Atlantic exploration that was going to find other trade routes, and they would seem to disappear, almost fall off the planet heavens in your roleplay game, picture them as another location for adventure, but the physics have to be strange. If the heavens are just another place that you can, you know, play murder hobo, you're, you're missing the point of it. You should put the players in environments, uh, whether they get there by wishes or magic portals or the old uh, special amulet take them there. But there should be changes to the game. Certain magic would be accelerated, certain magic would turn off, a certain aspect should change. And you can play with the physics, you can play with modern physics. In the heavens is where you can add more of a practical element. Uh, it could be warmer, uh, and thus you, you know, your players would not be able to wear their armor, or not as long. They would not, they, they might be so hot they can't touch the metal or sword. Well, why wouldn't that make their eyeballs close? Well, let's not get too practical about this. What you want to do is when you take the players into these celestial circles of wheels within wheels and take them to another place, you want them to, uh, to have that idea that they could fall from the sky. Uh, like uh, the, uh, uh, it's the guy with the wings. Eh, somebody will have to post it in the chat. I could go on Google. You know, this is where the old mind gives out. I'm just reminded of the Kansas song, Born on Wings of Steel. But uh, we want to leave the cliché evil and gods and demons behind and instead add another element. Uh, the heavens don't ne necessarily just need to be another place of houses. They should be something that's odd to in, in terms of game mechanics. Let's see, well, I'm always worried about my time. Yeah, about halfway done, usually. So let's see if we can go on, tell a little bit more about this. Now, uh, magic was always tied with religion, and it had been for thousands of years, probably about 7,000 years before the Greeks came onto the scene. And uh, the Greek era starts a little bit with um, the Troy, although it was more of a proto-Greek and an Achaean people who were enemies with the Minoans on the Isle of Crete. But uh, you have a uh, magic tie with religion, and a lot of this stuff was simply parlor tricks that were used on the faithful. Uh, for instance, uh, hollow idols have been found all around the world where the priest would go behind the idol and uh, stick his head inside so that he could listen to the petitions of the people that offered him gold, or he could 
command them through the idol to do certain things that would be expedient to him. Now, am I jaded about religion? Uh, to some degree, I think if used properly, this form of uh, psychoanalysis, somebody comes and confesses their, uh, their sins or confesses their problems, the priest uh, inside the idol pretending to be the god can tell them to live a better life. But for the most part, whenever chicanery is involved with the idea of a divine, you're really running into a thievery for a prophet. But uh, all religions were searching the skies for an order. It was the Greeks who finally gave it to them. Now, a number of civilizations could predict uh, the return of comets or could predict eclipses. It was really only the Greeks that were starting to explain it. The Greeks understood that if the moon was passing between the sun and our planet, it would cast the shadows. And they were looking at light, even though they were still under the concept that your eyes put out that gazer beam that light didn't flow into the eye as perception that the light was cast out of the eye. It was still the blockage of the, uh, the light uh, from your eye that was causing these shadows and causing these uh, eclipses. The calendar, of course, is based on the celestial motion. What was nice about a calendar is the priests could see certain constellations start to appear in the sky and it would trigger to uh, agrarian societies, ah, it's time to plant the potatoes, it's, uh, in the case of the Incan, it's time to uh, uh, plant the beans, sow the grains in the fields. It would be a trigger when they see the uh, uh, certain constellations disappear from the sky or certain constellations start to appear in the sky, they could tell the farming people, well, it's now time to start planting again. That way you wouldn't plant too early, you wouldn't plant too late, you would be able to harvest at the right time when you could store without rot. It was all working out through trial and error. But back to the magics uh, related to religion. So light of hand, if anyone's seen any sort of magician on YouTube or Penn and Teller's uh, Fool Me, sleight of hand is just absolutely amazing. And sleight of hand has existed for as long as there's been humans. And so priests of the age would use the sleight of hand. It was the skeptics of the age that start to expose some of these magic tricks as what they were. A little bit of dye poured into the water would make the appearance that you had transformed it into wine, but certainly wouldn't have the taste. And in some cases, that uh, dye that was poured into the water was more of a poison. You wouldn't want to taste it. Raising the dead was always a nice uh, trick to perform. Uh, it was uh, Galen who started to uh, talk about, well, if, you, if you're if you raising the dead, what exactly, you know, which part of the humor did you excise to bring it back to life? How did you make the heart restore itself? And a lot of these, uh, there's not a whole lot of raising of the dead within the, um, the Greek tragedies and the Greek uh, performance, performance theater, which was their, you know, chronicle of the day because it was seen as hocus pocus. There was no uh, heaven, there was no hell in the Greek uh, philosophy. There was only a place of darkness here where you, the bodies would all go and collect, the old and the young that died, the rich and the poor. They all sort of waited in the darkness of Hades with no end in sight. Theater was the, essentially the uh, chronographer of the day. A lot of the Greek uh, culture we, we know from the, the way it's, it appears in their plays. They had this uh, feature called a uh, deus ex machina. Now what that is is it means that the gods will move by machines or the gods will solve things through machines. Uh, there was a point in many plays where uh, the plot would be so thick and torn and beyond solvable that the gods would just show up and sort it all out. And then everyone would nod their head, they had a good time, they'd go home, let's bring on the uh, circus jugglers before the next play begins. But uh, the the skeptics of the time were starting to question, well, if, if this deus ex machina is just guys with pulleys, ropes, and wheels, uh, maybe the pulleys, ropes, and wheels is the magic, not necessarily the fact that there are gods about. Some of the first atheists were Greeks, people that absolutely were convinced that everything uh, evolved from cause and effect through some sort of natural order. Now they didn't use the words natural order, it's just that one reason they didn't use the words natural order is because they didn't speak English. But uh, in, as in contrast, the number of Greek words that appear in uh, megaphone uh, as one uh, that appear within the English language uh, show to the uh, the stamina of the Greek tradition. But the Greeks were great skeptics. They wanted to show me. They wanted to make sure that some something was practical and it was proved uh, to be effective. 
Greeks knew a lot about mirrors. They finally had the ability to create glass in flat planes and polish it well enough so that they could use it to reflect lights and cast lights. They would use this, especially with uh, prisms and color lights. They didn't understand that light was the blending of all the colors, but they knew that they could create different colored lights to create an eeriness in their theatrical shows, and it was the uh, special effects of their days. They could also control light and add shadows, a shadow puppetry, a light, uh, depending upon the, if the person stood closer to light or further from the light would be how big a shadow would be. They understood the mathematics of ratios enough, and uh, in the theatrical sense, they were using light for all of this. In your role play, I just think that light and shadow is, um, is undervalued in role play. Yeah, you cannot hit what you cannot see, but also uh, you, you, the fear of the utter blackness of a, of a room without light. I, I think a, a little bit more um, use of magic in, in controlling light and shadows and deception would probably go a long way in your role play, rather than having everyone just be magic missile, magic missile, sleep spell, and fireball. Uh, the actual acting mask that they used on stage had a built-in megaphone in the mouthpiece. That's just amazing to me that somebody would uh, know that you want to make sure that you're entertaining all the way to the top row. That person paid their price of admission as well. That booming voice of the uh, wizard in your roleplay game could just be an acoustical trick and a very good one for to frighten. All stage magic is uh, misdirection, confusion, and those carriages, as I said, being pulled back and forth by pulleys. Uh, that was seen as a, mo a force multiplier later on when they started to adapt them to uh, uh, weapons of war. The Greeks were some of the first to start using uh, what we considered a classical uh, catapult and uh, a ballista thrower, rock thrower, and uh, spear thrower. Uh, the effect of that at first would be more of a fear factor on the battlefield than it certainly would for any physical damage that would that would cause compared to a group of highly trained hoplites but also in in terms of sieges which to this time were almost impossible to resolve without a subterfuge somebody just opening the gates and letting the enemy in with siege engines you could actually start to uh, poison the enemy by throwing dead animal carcasses across their walls into their uh, streets Archimedes, I'll talk a little bit more about him uh, later, but uh, Archimedes, or just a moment, Archimedes was one of the first to realize that you could actually uh, use uh, mathematically built structures, engineering, uh, as weapons of war. Uh, spells. Now, spells for the longest time were just seen as evil, and of course they are evil. Uh, whenever you're using a spell, essentially you're, you're slapping the face of the powers that be. The powers in charge uh, like to be in charge, and they don't want to see individuals as having some sort of ability to use magic and upset that uh, power. In most of the games I run, I, both the peasants are convinced that magic is not just blasphemous, but going to cause uh, strife and chaos within their, their orderly society, stop the f uh, fields from growing, uh, starve them all, plague them all, and it's probably true. But also, uh, spells at their simplest are just seen as evil prayers. When you pray to the gods or you pray for somebody's health, uh, benevolence is uh, justified and they like that. When you start praying that people uh, meet with mishap, uh, issuing curses, uh, those are basically seen as outlawed at the very minor, it's insubordinate, and at the most major, it's blasphemous. Anything that's blasphemous, well, even up to the 1700s, we were burning people as witches. In the ancient world, or in your fantasy world, magic users probably get burned at the stake a lot. Amulets. Amulets were basically seen as a way of containing the curse. Now that the Greeks had an idea that there were four elements, many of them started searching for the perfect combination of those four elements to create that special object that would both either increase my fertility or uh, make uh, people admire me more, uh, improve my singing voice, whatever. A lot of amulets were also seen as uh, being able to deflect metals and uh, protect the person from a magical attack. Many also were seen as causing ill luck. The Greeks used a, fi a system of ostracism to get rid of people, uh, especially political opponents, that they didn't like. It usually wasn't a permanent thing. It was just sort of go away for seven years, come back when you have better sense. Uh, we don't want to fight you politically. And so they would vote for these ostracism who were going to kick out of the city this uh, month on tablets. And, uh, and there's a lot of wells that have a lot of tablets at the bottom of them. 
from the amount of either ballot uh, box stuffing or all of the negative ostracism tablets were taken and thrown away rather than getting rid of a playwright that uh, was admired or, or a, a leader. Alcibiades, I think, was ostracized and brought back at one time. Uh, but uh, amulets were seen as a form of ill luck if you could get that amulet planted in somebody's house, uh, drop it in their wine cup, they would drink that ill luck that you put in the amulet. A lot of the magic in role play games, it would almost be more interesting if it was, and not just ingested, but it was this something that was planted on you. It was a charm. It was a curse. It was that bug in the modern adventure movie, you know, they're tracking me, I gotta get rid of my shoes and my belt, and it should be the same somewhere, you know, the sword or the pommel has changed, a gem I've stone I put on it is what's causing me ill will. Because the Greeks studied a lot of uh, plants, and they learned a lot about poisons. Some of the finest poisoners in the Roman era were the Greeks that were brought in to do the dirty work. Poisons are an underutilized aspect of role-playing games. Uh, in World of Warcraft, uh, you, you have uh, poisons only being used by rogues, and it's only basically just an extra damage modifier, although they, they do have some slowness and anti-casting effect, but those are to a lesser degree. But uh, the poisons in role-play games really need to be developed. The potions have been really widely developed, but the poisons less so. There was an old Judges Guild pamphlet that I owned that had a list of, I think it was 10 different types of poisons and the types of damage they did. Again, it was more just a damage element, but the fact that just certain types of poisons, from the purple worm, the most deadliest, down to the common uh, tarantula or uh, black widow poison, but the Greeks were basically seeing poison both from vipers and from insects that they were learning, but also from plants, that arsenic, and all of these other natural poisons and what they could do with them. They were never found a way of using them and utilizing them in warfare and weaponizing them to that degree, but it certainly made their politics a lot more interesting. And on the other side, you love potions. It's always been a favorite uh, for mankind. If there was just some drink that you could give to your beloved, that she would love you as much as you love her, or you could cast the, catch the favor of your husband again. So love potions were always popular, and uh, there were many of alchemists that were experimenting with love potions. Uh, since Viagra is actually based on a more primitive, uh, I should say more natural source, aspirin based on a natural source, I've got to believe that, that somebody, some conjurer through the ages, some natural uh, herbalist, had found equivalents there still is even modern beliefs that there are natural aphrodisiacs out there, although most of them have been debunked by modern science. Please stop killing the rhino. Uh, oracles uh, were ever-present in Greek uh, society. They made divine prediction. One of the most uh, important divine predictions that oracles made was the weather. And they actually used a primitive sort of barometer to look at barometric pressure and know whether or not it's going to rain or not, and which would be very important to people that uh, spend a good deal of time on the water's uh, choppy seas. So the oracles were uh, using a little bit of magic science uh, to help predict the weather. Uh, the popular fables of the day were constantly being reimagined. It's interesting to me that the Greeks, they had an ability to see something on the stage and then believe it had always been part of their tradition. I don't want to call it an ephemeral nature, but certainly it's a nature of democracy that what becomes popular seems to become eternal. So we start with Homer. Homer was uh, basically a, a bard. He was a man that went from noble home to noble home and entertained by telling this wonderful story about the Trojan War and the Trojan Horse and Odysseus uh, as a king trying to get back to his uh, fabled Ithaca. Homer uh, essentially is just a teller of stories, but if you go to some of the other great men that, that actually were historians, the first was Herodotus, and he was telling tales of the Persian War. Now, of course, he was coloring it from a winner hero's point of view. It definitely had an us and them sort of uh, tit-for-tat, and then later on uh, Thucydides decided that he wasn't going to add any sort of magic any sort of characterization. He was going to tell things like there is. If you get the time to read Thucydides, it is amazing as a study of mankind, mankind's hatred, and how small war is on the actual battlefield. Oedipus. Oedipus was cursed, as was Herac Heraclides, you know, Hercules. Odysseus was cursed. The playwrights helped perpetuate the ideas that strong men were the state, yet 
all the strong men were doomed to fail in some way. It was almost comforting to in a democracy to know that you're not going to have a dictator for long. That eventually the other side is going to win because every man is naturally corrupt or doomed. Again, deus es machia, bring on the gods with their machines and spinning stage floors, pulleys. Euripides favored greatly this deus es ex machina to bring in an ending to his plays. Aristophanes, who was another playwright who wrote mostly in the comedic sense, hated the idea that that uh, these stories were always uh, brought ended by the gods. When you, if you're role playing, your referee is constantly bringing the gods in to both give you the quest and end the quest. Well. Maybe he's of the Euripides function, and maybe you need a little bit more Aristophanes, who rejected his rival as pretty hackneyed. So we're up to Pythagoras and uh, mathematics. Oh, the Greeks and their geometry. Amazing stuff that they finally would codify this. They knew about triangles, perfect triangles, or right triangles. They studied you know, Euclidean geometry is still studied today because it it works as a model and it works for an understanding. Their logic still exists today because uh, they were as skeptics, and uh, their their notion that you can um, use syllogism to uh, prove truths. It's just amazing stuff, and some of this stuff, I don't know if it has a roleplay aspect. It certainly has a roleplay aspect of a thought puzzle in your game, rather than every uh, mechanical and twisted puzzle that appears in your underworld. Pythagoras, among others, was very fixated on numbers and the digits of ten. There were a lot of magic that was associated with the ability to amplify and diminish numbers and patterns. You, perhaps your magic in your roleplay game could be influenced by as simple as a, a, die, a die four. Every uh, four die on the third round, every four, uh, four die on the uh, first round, magic either is amplified or diminished, and uh, it can add another flavor to it. The fact that uh, most of the uh, magic users in roleplay games are turned into just magical howitzers is, is really off-putting to me. If all the guy is is 100 hit points damage whenever you want it, then just replace all magic with a few wands and let the players actually play something that has a little bit more interest and strategy to it. Archimedes, oh what a marvelous guy Archimedes was. Give me a lever and a place to stand and I will tilt the world. It is incredibly heady stuff. During the siege of Syracuse, uh, the Greeks in their moment of, of hubris, the Athenians, after they pretty much were winning the Peloponnesian War, and theirs was the society that was going to last for a thousand years, they decided to attack the city of Syracuse. Who knows what the rivalry was there, but Archimedes was ready, and he actually created a claw machine, claw machine of doom. Some of the people who have game with me would know that reference. A claw machine that could pluck ships right out of the water. He also had a, a death ray of sort where he concentrated the sunlight in um, with mirrors. Now, the Mythbusters, of course, was unable to reproduce it. But the fact that the ships would be blinded by these mirrors is an amazing thing in its own right. And the fact that there still would be a mysticism associated. Where did this light come from? Why does Syracuse have a thousand suns protecting it? But Archimedes is one of the first documented engineers. He was uh, basically looking at the mechanical object of the Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, the physicians and healing. Now, Hippocrates was probably instrumental as a person because he was one of the first to start to realize that the body will heal itself. The four humors of fire, earth, uh, water, and air will come back into balance if you allow the body to rest and heal. He was one of the first to start to equate what you eat about what is what you will become. A lesson I think many of us role players need to start taking a little bit more to heart. So he was one who started to prescribe diet and exercise and a simpler life and getting out of the accumulating filth and disease that was being concentrated in the cities. Get away from your livestock for a little while. Uh, stay away from your pigs for a season and see if that improves your health. Uh, the Olympics and gymnastics, are, of course, are a part of Greek tradition. They both were a means of training for war, but also they were part of this idea of putting the, the humors back in balance quelling the fire until it's necessary to be brought and harnessed. And of course muscle tone was seen as uh, building uh, all of that uh, great strength around the bones, the perfect elements of the body. 
brings us to close to the end, and we'll talk a little bit about Aristotle. Aristotle cannot be undervalued. Aristotle went a step further, and even he rejected much of the Platonic uh, Plato's philosophy. He was taught by Plato, and he alone changed our understanding of the natural order. He looked at the world as an idea of eternal aspects within objects. Plato looked at a place, a realm, that perfect things existed and man would occasionally get a glimpse of them and try to model in the world. Aristotle looked at all objects themselves as having internal aspects that made them what they were. Water is different from land, different from earth, because of an, an eternal aspect about the object. And of course, he thought that geometry was the secret to everything. If you can just study something in its shape and form, you will understand its pure essence and soul. Now, Aristotle's philosophy would last all the way to the Renaissance, when then it was broke down even more uh, and categorized, and also some of the ideas that he had, like an idea of an ether, or the idea of gravity, uh, the way it was presented by Aristotle uh, as uh, the attraction between Earth to Earth. Now, those would all be broken down and, and re-explained, of course, famously by the apple and uh, Newton. Aristotle looked at all of the world as just a series of cause and effects. When things were not working, it wasn't a matter of misbalance. It was a matter of other things reacting on the world. In a way, the freestyle magic system is perhaps one of the best examples of how magic will break the world down because it is essentially adding forces to the world that didn't exist in the balance. That's my mandatory plug that corporate makes me make. Aristotle saw all objects as real, but each had its own purpose as endowed by some sort of creator. And he didn't really define the creator. It could have been the pantheon gods, it could have been some greater gods, it could have been just the fact that all objects had to come from a source, and all those objects by coming from a source were endowed with a purpose. The Catholic Church loved that aspect, that everything all objects were real and endowed by a creator. Since they were fine with that, Aristotle's uh, philosophy would last for probably another 2,000 years until the Renaissance. More later.